Now there's going to be a lot of jobs in how you prompt and direct and oversee AI. So yes, you may, the job uh, skills may shift, uh, job titles may shift, but it's going to hopefully create a, a, a more thoughtful and creative, uh, a more thoughtful job. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Seat Go Create. This is your host, Tim Winders. I'm an executive coach, and I just have fun getting to ask the questions. Today's no different. This is the place here at Seat Go Create. This is where we challenge conventional definitions of success, explore stories of transformation in leadership, business, and in ministry. You're going to go heavy in leadership and business today. In today's episode, I've got the privilege of talking to Brandon Cobb. He's a marketing and profit-driving executive with a track record of pioneering courageous marketing strategies for some really cool, iconic brands. He's got a focus on innovation, customer engagement, and team leadership. He's played an integral role in turning companies around, fostering growth, and strengthening brand loyalty. Brandon, welcome to Seat Go Create. Thank you, Tim. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited that you're here too. We were chit-chatting briefly, trying to get internet going and all just a minute ago. And I think we got it. So let's dive in. My question, first question, icebreaker. We just bump into each other, not entirely untrue. And I just like to know more about you. And I say, what do you do? What's your answer when someone says, what do you do? I like to say I help companies that are providing a value to the world continue to profit and grow so they can continue to add value to the world and scale that value. So, you know, I'm not talking about just things that are so much how people would think of like a charity or something like that, but it could be if it's a product or service that's providing an efficiency, a convenience, it could be a good thing, a positive thing to the world as well. But anything that, that really is adding value to the world, I like to help them continue to improve so they can keep scaling that. And sometimes it's hard to gauge value. Sometimes is in the eye of the beholder. We've got a lot of ministry folks and church things. And then some people think that some products have value, some don't. I don't get into that because I think the world has a lot of opportunity there. Did I see somewhere, have you done anything with MTV? I did, yeah. When I first went to, to undergraduate and everything, I wanted to go do film. And I ended up uh, doing marketing and producing films and doing marketing in the film industry for a handful of years. But one of my first things was with MTV and their on-air promotions in New York City. So right there in Times Square, anybody that may remember back in the 90s or where there was like the TRL studio, we were right there and where they used to do those top 10 videos. And yeah, right there in Times Square, it was really great. We were creating a lot of commercials, promoting all their shows. I think I'm a little older than that. I actually remember when MTV still did videos before they started doing all the other stuff. I remember when MTV hit the air. That's how old I am. So. You you were there when they were starting well, I can, some changes. Yeah, and I can say most of the people, like when I was there as one of the younger people, I, most of the people that were there were actually, that was their biggest statement, was that they were just upset that that was the direction it was going and they wanted the videos back. And uh, yeah, but anyway, nevertheless, it was a very cool gig and a fun time. Yeah, good. So what is the coolest gig you've had? I mean, you mentioned some brands and I looked through your your profile and some of the stuff. And I know they all are cool in their own right, but what's the one that's, you know what, this was a really good gig. So if you step outside of just like movie making, because that's a whole world in its own, then I would say there was a company I was with in, in Los Angeles. It was called Not Impossible Labs. And they basically would try to take somebody, try to take a medical situation that currently had no solution and come up with a hack, a cheap and easy hack to solve that medical problem. And for example, there was a graffiti artist, really great artist that became paralyzed. And they created a pair of glasses that had a camera on it for about $15, you could make it. And he could maneuver a computer through the, just moving his eye and it would track his eye movement and it would spray paint out where he, so he could now draw with his eye. Or that same company, we created like a deaf 
music experience. So we partnered with Beats by Dre and there was a vibration, whole vibration system on uh, people who were deaf and they could experience the music or 3D printing prosthetic arms uh, for, again, like $15. In the Sudan and Africa, they were having a civil war and we were printing arms for $15 instead of $15,000. So it was like cheap and easy hacks and it was pretty cool. And it and incorporated a lot of marketing and media, partnering with big brands to do their kind of showing that they're doing good in the world. They're using their technology and their resources to give back to the world. So that, uh, I, I love the thought of that. I'm sitting here going, wow, it's almost like in this category of like where the Make-A-Wish Foundation, where they're just trying to make things happen. And I, the reason I really love that is that they're, you're looking for solutions that are maybe less expensive, not high dollar where, you know, and I, I think the term hack is a good one there. So what's, what's maybe the weirdest one you've ever run across is this is a weird thing. And especially going back to what you said, you do, you help people that bring value to the world. And, and I don't want you to, I'm not trying to call out any like former clients or things, but. I'm always interested to see things like this is unique value that they're bringing to the world. Mm -hmm. I'd like to maybe hit on something more recently. So I've been providing fractional services for the last year and a half to a variety of companies. And so a lot of kind of early stage uh, startups or people, maybe companies that are existing, but they're, they want to bring a new product to market. And there was, with all the talk of AI and everything, there was a company called Bolsteru that is mixing the traditional content management systems of, of marketing, the buffer, the hoot suites, the pre-scheduling out of your content on social media. So they're mixing that, that pre-scheduling out with AI generative content creation. I helped them. I had experience in real estate. So I, I connected them with a couple of clients in, in the real estate industry. They really targeted their product that how do you write uh, property descriptions or how do you write general real estate informational posts. And then it creates that it's not just the text, it's the image. And then there's still a human interaction. So the human reviews the content, but then hits schedule. But it you basically, you just plug in that, hey, I want all the next week, a content for next week. It pumps it out, you approve it, and it's now scheduled. So I think this is it's, it's not cutting edge of, of using AI and, and trying to uh, provide a new value to the world that maybe didn't exist a couple of years ago. That's fascinating. That actually gives me a line of questioning I'd love to drill down on. I actually thought of this is the impact that AI is having on, we'll just call it the marketing industry, because obviously it's the buzz now. A lot of people are talking about it, which is cool. And I think it should be just with this project, the podcast, we have, I can't tell you how many AI tools that we're using going all the way from the editing process to even you'll get a kick out of this. One of the things, I don't know if I should say this or not. This could be like, I'll say it anyway. One of the things I do before I sit down with someone like you that we haven't met, we've interacted some, you reached out to our people and we scheduled this, is I'll take a list of things on your LinkedIn or what you say you do or resume or one pager or something like that. I'll pop it in the uh, AI tool, either chat GPT or Claude or something like that. I said, hey, Write a short little blurb. In fact, the blurb I said at the beginning sort of came from AI. And then I say, give me 10 cool and interesting questions to ask this person. Now, I want to say I rarely get to those questions, but it is interesting to see. So I think it's touching a lot of industries. What's it doing to the world of marketing? What is AI doing there? I think you gave an example with this company, but just either general or specific, whatever, wherever you'd like to go with it. I think out of any industry or any department within companies or any industry, I think marketing could be one of the uh, biggest beneficiaries of AI just because of uh, the generative portion of creating content. I think if you think of uh, a customer profile or persona, um, you could talk with it and say who you're trying to target. Hey, create this persona. And then you can start to create, ad, commu keep, continue to communicate with the AI to create ads targeted at that persona. So now it's still, the human's still the pilot and this is the co-pilot, but it's the, you're, you're still giving instructions and it's just probably hyper speeding up the, the, the process, maybe eliminating the need for some 
of the the specialist positions, but being a marketing generalist, you can still shape it and direct it. I talked to the CMO of uh, eBay, and they are using it to on display ads that show up all across the web and follow you around and things to make a more personalized, customized experience. Uh, generally, you would have a graphic designer or somebody create those display ads, and uh, now the exact same ad may have 10,000 variations, for example. And AI may have created those 10,000 variations. So you may have had a graphic designer create the initial one or something like that, but then you want a bunch of variations. And then now how do you place on where it, it, it's really, and it might be this the slightest tweak, but that slightest tweak may connect with somebody a little differently depending on what their activity is online. I, that is not fully... Nobody's just letting it run wild on its own yet. It's still got that human interaction. So there's a, a time lag. It's not, oh, I click on this website. Now I have this custom custom image. It's still going through a human checks and balances process. But but I figure at someday there's going to be where the ads will change for you. They're not pre-created, but they, they will change for you based on the pathways you're going down in and eventually companies will just let this run free. So I actually see, this is the way I describe a lot of technology like this, is that it's really cool. And then it's a little creepy at the same time. There's kind of these things, what you just brought up. I absolutely can see that because if we just go backwards in time, we see some things now that are on full auto with, um, anyway, I can't think examples, but there's a lot of things that are on auto that we thought we always need a human what about, this is kind of the thing that's bothering people now. This doesn't bother me as much, but what about jobs in the marketing field? I also notice. I think you do some, I think you're a professor, you do some teaching and all for some schools. What about the future of work and jobs in the marketing arena? What jobs are going to go away? What's in jeopardy? And then what are some of the opportunities? Maybe that's a way to ask it. First, I'll say I've always been taught through the MBA that I did. And now I'm also in addition to work, I started a doctorate. It's made for working professionals. So through all the business education I've done, I've always been taught, don't be afraid of, this was back in the day, like outsourcing, because outsourcing will create a new job, a better job. Or don't be afraid of now technology replacing. And if you go back to, okay, email came about. Well, it replaced a lot of traditional mail, snail mail, possibly jobs or something. Or if you go back, the alarm clock replaced window bangers in the morning of waking people up. So these, so yes, jobs are going to be replaced, but new jobs are going to be created. Now email comes about, okay, maybe there's not tra traditional mail jobs, but there's a ton of jobs in the email space. And now, same thing. So now there's going to be a lot of jobs and how you prompt and direct and oversee AI. So yes, you may, the job uh, skills may shift, uh, job titles may shift, but it's going to hopefully create a, a, a more thoughtful and creative, uh, a more thoughtful job maybe. But I think the specific jobs that will go away are graphic designers are, are in somewhat danger. The copywriters are in, in somewhat danger. You see it in, in LA right now, with the, just in Hollywood, that the actors are afraid of the voiceover. I can still tell always when it's an AI voice, but I think humans are going to get better and better at detecting what's AI generated, but AI is going to get better and better at creating content that is more human-like. So yeah, I think actors, I think there's certain elements of, of things that are, are in danger, but but at the same time, it's going to open up a whole new world of possibilities. You just got to be looking at what uh, shaping what's uh, below it. So you you may have to adjust your skill set, but I think in all, overall, it's a great thing. A uh, disclaimer here, I want everyone to know that I'm an actual person and talking and asking questions and Brandon is an actual person. Sometimes we I do think we're coming to that stage where we're going to have to probably do that because someone brought up recently, they say, you know, with all the audio that's out there with you and guests and things like that, 200 and I don't know, 20 something episodes now here at Seat Go Create, it's going to be very easy to train 
for your voice. I'm going, this voice, Georgia boy who's tried to get rid of Southern accent. They go, oh, yeah, that'll probably be pretty, pretty easy. And so that's, I think that's going to be fascinating. And I do agree with you. For me, it's always been like the first time I stepped in and I'm not exactly would be considered like a Gen Z or even these generations. In fact, I'm the tail end of the baby boomer generation. But when I see tech, I usually watch briefly and then I jump on board. And so I started doing things with AI and, and I just perceive it as a writing assistant and a brainstorm partner for the things that I'm <laughs> doing. And I guess related to that, there's something that's related to marketing that I do want to bring up and then we'll move on to some other things off of AI. But I have wondered because of the capacity of social media and all the channels that are out there, I have wondered because it is so easy. We notice it just with what we're doing here, this project here, that it is so easy to create content. Is it good mm -hmm. content? Is it great content? Is it mediocre content? I'm not sure. I could judge it some with my eye, but then some I'm letting the audience judge that. Are we going to see a massive influx of just more stuff out there? And I know that will impact the marketing arena because we're really vying for people's attention, in my opinion. And mm -hmm. so wh what are your thoughts on that? Because I know just for me in the last six months, I've created more content. I've considered writing a, a few more books. I wrote a wrote one that took me five years. Now I'm thinking, gosh, I might could do five a year instead of it taking five years. What are your thoughts just on the ability to just crank it out? I think probably there will be more content. Yeah. I think that we may also get better at summarizing or, or getting through content faster. Just the same way on, on like listening to videos, you listen to them at 1.5 speed or 2.2.0 speed, or you can take content now and put it into the chat GPT and have it sum it up for you. So I think, yeah, there's going to be, there's going to be more out there. And I think from a marketing perspective, like you said, grabbing attention, creating, you don't want to, you don't want to take a, a concept or idea that people are believing and completely just say, oh, that's garbage or that's all false and stuff, because a lot of people just be like, that's absurd. But you can uh, take uh, a lot of what's going out there and try to be, say something about what's going on is wrong. So it's just a slight shift. And so it, it, that's the attention grabbing information and the attention grabbing content will be the things that don't fully wipe out a person's belief, but shocks them a little bit and redirects it. So if you're taking, so I guess this is, this goes into another, this is one strategy of how you grab attention, but there's a lot of ways you can grab attention. I mean, you know, back there were social media posts where certain colors would stop the scroll, but, but yeah, I think you just got to find a way that kind of, as people are going through a ton of content passively, it grabs their attention and makes them conscious. And that's what you need to do with your marketing. I want to circle back uh, maybe towards the tail end as we're wrapping up and talk about some strategies and things for some of the business owners and leaders of organizations that are listening in. I think you've got a lot of value there, but I, I want to, I, I, one of the things that I love to do here is find out how people came into whatever they're doing and you know, some of the highs, the lows, the, you know, some, even the good, the bad, and the ugly. I think that's a valuable story. Have you always been like marketing guy, like this kind of a joke on the playground in elementary school or wherever you went to school, were you like, man, I'm going to do marketing someday, or is that something you've moved into? So however you want to share your background or story, that's really me saying, how did Brandon come to be an expert in the area of marketing and how far back does that go? I think there's a lot of things that play up to where I'm at now. And uh, when you talk about going back to the playground, I remember friends telling me like, oh, I love to tell a story or something like that. And, and then I fell in love with video creation and creative, the creative space a bit, but video content specifically. And that's where I pursued some stuff in the film industry, but it was also very tough. And, and I, I understood the business side of things. I wasn't just, I'm split minded and not just like, uh, 
uh, all business or all creative. I'm a little bit of both. And with that marketing kind of naturally uh, fell into place. I was always good with math and numbers, which I think now with marketing, data and analytics are becoming more and more important. I took more jobs when ori- originally trying to pursue some stuff in the film industry just to get by and that built a skill set that then helped in the film industry, but also now has provided a whole career um, that is generalizable across industries. And that's the way I really look at marketing is that um, some of the skill sets, like, yeah, there's nuances in each industry, but a lot of the marketing skill sets can cross over industries or you can bring a fresh perspective because a lot of times in a certain industry, people get stuck in certain ways of, of everybody mimicking other organizations or companies in that same industry. And if you come from an outside perspective, you can bring some of the marketing principles and cross it over. So I would just say that, yeah, my from storytelling, from being creative, from being mathematical and business minded still, it just was like a good overall fit that, that you know, where I fit in well. Or at what point, and I don't know if you think of an example or if it was just a process, at what point was there a time where you looked in the mirror or you had a situation, client, whatever, where you went, huh? I'm actually pretty good at this. This is something that I'm pretty good at in the the marketing arena. Can you think of an example? That's a little bit of a tough question. Hopefully I didn't get you thinking about that. There there's been several times that this is clear. I I was at a, an organization in Columbus, Ohio that had 500 retail locations across the US and I was in their field marketing throwing a bunch of events and I we got mayors of cities to come out for grand opening ribbon cuttings. And, and then we got it put on the front page of the local newspapers. I remember the CEO of that company coming up to me and telling me, Brandon, you're on, you're on the fast track or something like this. And that was, and then I, I was awarded like their corporate employee of the month and it was a couple thousand person company. So like that just reaffirmations are like, are, are there. And then I would say, being in LA and being able to market to to where we can generate opportunities successfully, both on the creation, being able to fundraise and create projects, then also distribute them and, and return the investments and everything. I think that was it. In the real estate industry, I had a lot of reaffirmations too. I think it's a lot of times the CEO is coming up to me and, and reaffirming that that they believe in me or they're behind me. The CEO of a, a real estate company I was with, they put me as their keynote speaker at a leadership conference. And after I spoke, he came up just to close out the conference and he, he told me I'm fully behind you and everything. So I think those are the, the reaffirmations. I'll say though, at the same point, uh, there's a lot of times where there's doubt too, because that's, that's what I was about uh, to ask. I was about to ask, okay, so when have been the times that you went, cause redefining success is like our main theme here. When has it been tough? And you've gone, oh boy. So that's really what I like to dig at. And it brings me full circle because the thing is, there's been other times where I don't, I know some, I I don't know, I can never be a hundred percent sure, but I'm confident that what I'm saying, proposing is correct and in the best interest of the company, the best, but I don't, I cannot convince a CEO or a CFO to believe in me or get the green light to go do something. And it brings me to why I'm in the the DBA now. It brings me why I went and did an MBA, which was I hit a wall at some point. I'm like, I need more knowledge, more skills to be able to overcome uh, this. And so for what I'm currently experiencing is that when you get asked to put together a marketing campaign, a lot of that mix of channels and how you're going to do the spend, but what the whole approach of everything on the marketing campaign, a lot of times that comes from the marketer's intuition. You can't necessarily say this is for sure going to create this result. You are proposing it because you think it's going to achieve the goals. But And the only way you can go out and get that done is if you get the trust and the belief from a CEO or CFO, whoever is writing off on that green light. And, but if I get the green light, I feel like it does tend to work. But so now I'm working on how do you present more really good projections and data to back up why we should do what suggesting to do. And, but when you hear that from a CEO or CFO that, that they just think what you're saying is 
may not at all be correct, it really questions yourself. Like, am I correct on this or am I not correct? A lot of times I'll go weeks thinking and thinking about it and I'll come back and I'm like, I still stand by that statement and it's for their best interest. But it's, but I guess that's where it's at is who actually knows better. I think the real result is, or the real answer is that there's no one way to do everything. There's a hundred ways to get to the same goal and you just have to figure out ways to align and, and work together and stuff. I think one of the struggles there, because I deal with it, I, I work as an executive coach and, and I'm in on some of these conversations where we're discussing marketing. I don't consider myself a marketing expert or anything, but I, I work with leaderships and leadership teams. And I, I think a lot of it comes down to, we want to know, and this is so many things in business. This is why your math skill is beneficial. We want to know if we spend X, that we're going to get 4X, 10X, hopefully more mm-hmm. ROI return on it. And sometimes, this is where I'm going back to that confidence level. Sometimes, but sometimes there's variables. I just sat in early this morning on a meeting. This is a vacation resort area that I'm at. And they were cooking through all COVID and all that kind of stuff. And their numbers are off. And they were talking about sales. And their sales are way, way down. Sales are way down in a lot of areas right now. It's a weird time. Or in a little while, I'm probably going to ask you about your views on some big picture things. But how do you, I guess this is an ROI question. How do you really attach ROI to marketing? How do you overcome when someone question? There's so many ways of going here because it's really an ROI question to me. It and is, like yeah. you said, there's cred- credibility that's involved. Can you deliver on this? Is this really going to return us or are we just going to spend money? And a lot of people think about marketing, especially social media. So, man, we're just going to flush it down the toilet, never to see it and all that. So what, when someone brings up ROI, what are some things that come to your mind and just have whatever your thoughts are on that? I'm working on it now. That's my whole doctorate project that I'm working on, but it's attribution and, and proving that ROI. But with that being said, I, I think marketers are very good at a first touch point attribution and a last touch point attribution. We're not very good at a multi touch point attribution, crediting everything to the first ad or the first capture of information, even though there may be many months later of continuing to continue to persuade until a purchase is made. Or giving all the credit to the last touch point. So the actual point, the actual touch that pushes them over the edge and makes them buy, but we're not able to properly weigh and understand everything that happens in the middle. So I think we need to get better with that. Going back to AI, I think AI can help with some of that, some of their calculations and algorithms and things like that. But with that being said, I think that it, it is very interesting because I've literally had campaigns or departments and different things that are profitable returning and i'm still being asked that question of like understanding though is okay it is profitable and it's profitable by this percentage but but what's causing the profit where can we cut or where can we increase and really try to optimize and 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 make that as efficient as possible and so i've had where even if the big picture is working You still have to explain inside that black box of what's going on inside the inner workings and why. And yeah, I think it's something that the marketing industry is not good with. Digital wise, we're it's it's much easier to attribute and give credit and track. When it's not digital, it it becomes a lot more difficult. But yeah, this is what I'm working on. Literally, I'm I'm gonna do a a a thing where you've got uh it could be 20 variables or any number of variables, but to make it easy. Let's say you have three variables. You have a TV ad, a radio ad, and a social media ad. What's the total revenue? You take out the radio ad. What's the total revenue? You put the radio ad back in. What's the total revenue? And then if you just look at the radio ad by itself, what's the total revenue? So basically what that's going to tell you is how does the mix, or if you're cooking with a recipe and a mix of ingredients, what does that that radio ad do that makes it greater as a whole than just that ad? itself individually, which is the the integrated concept. Everybody understands it, but you still can't explain it. It's something that the market, this is where the marketing industry is going. You have to, we, we're going to have to get better because people want to know that. Yeah. The interesting thing about that, I just had a flashback. I just, I had to 
go to Atlanta, my old hometown, and I was stuck in traffic, which if you're in Atlanta, there's a good chance you're stuck in traffic. And I was driving south and there was this, there's this big smokestack right in downtown Atlanta that they've got a very visible digital billboard there. And I know the company that does it, Corey Outdoor Advertising, because I worked there 40 years ago in high school when we were first starting the billboard business. But it is a massive digital billboard that they were advertising Miller beer, I think. And of course, you can make the change and all that. And I'm sitting there in traffic looking at it going, first of all, how much does it cost? I know it's a very expensive because it is a very prominent display right around the Grady Curve of uh, the connector in, in downtown Atlanta. But then I'm wondering, what is the value to Miller, the beer? And I've seen other advertisements there. And like you said, it's very difficult to say, which leads to really what you were just talking about. And I don't know if there's a real answer for this, and maybe it's a guess, but how much of what you do, would you put it in the area of science? I'll, we'll call it in the general science. And then how much is it just touch, feel, art? Is there a percentage breakdown? I know you mentioned you're good at math, you're a storyteller, all that kind of, and creative. I think a lot of people like to get super creative with marketing, but they need more math and science. And then some people are all about testing this. That I, I lean more towards testing. I'm not as creative, but what, what are your thoughts? Where do you put it? So I've always had a saying that you can't do marketing without data, but data doesn't tell the whole story. Revenue does. You, what's the percentage? I think you can analyze... You, you can put proof, proof behind possibly 50% of marketing, but maybe not. I think you'd be really happy if you could prove that this is, but then there's going to be 50% that is the art side of things. And I think it's just about trying to move that needle where we can prove it a little bit more, like even on the art side, justifying why the art needs to be the way the art is on certain elements. Just uh, a little bit more. If you look at different industries, the stock market, if you could take out all the variables and you could figure out that based off these variables that you can predict 10% of, you can understand 10% of how the stock market's going to move, but 90% of it, you don't know. If you could make that 20%, now you're very happy or something. So it's in marketing. Like there may be some industries where we know 90%. And you just, net, they're just trying to get to that other, that last 10%. In statistics, they call it the R, kind of like R squared. It's like telling specifically how much is explained by the different variables you're considering. And I think in marketing, we don't have anywhere close to the 100% picture, but we're able to, and that's the goal is, yeah, trying to get better, but art is certainly part of it. And if you don't mind, I want I wanted to say something more on, and this goes back to art, but it's also back to the AI conversation, which is humans have a natural uh, ability to touch other humans' emotions. We humans go through depression or anxiety or different things, and they have a certain way of being able to communicate uh, verbally and non-verbally that is able to hit different on a person. Then, and that's the art, and that's the human side that the AI can't do too. And I think that's also going to be the difficult thing to duplicate. And I think that's then the value that we humans need to be able to bring to that, that formula. Brandon, one of the things that I think you're probably in a unique position to speak to is, I don't know, maybe trends, what you're seeing, big picture that's going on, just I don't want to know. I don't know if it's the economy as a whole or something. I'm noticing some interesting trends where, depending on who you talk to and who you believe, we're a year or so out of a global pandemic. And a lot of people thought we were going to still really be growing. I think I'm seeing some leveling off with some industries I'm interacting with. And maybe just whatever you want to share about what your views are about some things that are going on with the economy and the world or anything like that. I'm just going to give you a shot here without a very specific question, because I think you see a lot of stuff. So what are you seeing? I see. Surprisingly, we've been talking about the recession coming that hasn't. It's came, but it has the came. Like at the same time, we've had inflation. You have it. Maybe everybody feels different things are harder to 
uh, afford in different ways or less spending power, but like the spending hasn't stopped. The business opportunities haven't stopped. So that's a little surprising, I think, also in a good way, possibly. I don't know if it's mixed there, but mixed that bad and good. The, the less spending power is bad, but the... I think there is a growing divide of, there's going to continue to be a growing divide, fortunately, of of wealth, of people who, and skills as well. And that's when we're talking about all this change from pre-COVID, you were working more in office, now people working virtually, you've got all these new technologies and everything else. So it's, I think those who adapt to the new world are going to do really well. And those who don't adapt are there, I think there's just going to be a divide there. And I think it's also a divide where maybe the lower side of things are more well taken care of than in the previous uh, past. Things like clothes and material goods are are probably going to continue to become more and more affordable. I think it's Elon Musk who said that eventually like, all people can afford all things. If you think about it, like uh, when iPhone first came out, not everybody could afford an iPhone. Now everybody can afford iPhone or maybe back in, I remember donating clothes or food and different things, to different people. And of course, homeless problems and everything else, but like clothes have become more affordable. Most uh, there's all the discount stores, like people have a lot of things now. So I think the divide will be like, you're well taken care of here, but if you're doing well, you're doing really well. And I also... Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I don't know exactly. Obviously, I don't think anybody does where things are going, but I think it's a both a scary but a exciting time. And you need to keep trying. You need to keep learning and you need to keep understanding that the capitalism that we've always loved for U.S. of being able to have mobility up and down and work hard and achieve results, hopefully will continue to be there. But uh, you need to but understand that if you're not giving a full effort to readjust and, and relearn and continue to grow, then uh, don't be upset if you slide down on the scale. So you need to keep working hard and you, I hopefully you can uh, see the benefits of that. I think the, uh, all that was great info. I think the thing I really love the most is that people need to continue growing <laughs> and being open to new things and but the age I'm at, I see so many of my peers that have stopped for some of them going on 20, 30 years, learning new things and doing new things. And here, my wife and I are experimenting with some new business things related to using AI to <laughs> increase some things. So I think that's great, great advice. And I like the thought there because I do think things are changing and we're not really going to know. I love to think about what the future might look like. But if we were having this conversation in 2015, we never would have projected what happened over the next five or six years. I don't, I wouldn't have, no. and I think I know this kind of stuff. Just come on. Yeah. But uh, Hey, I see that you work, obviously you probably, I guess, in the environment that you do your teaching in, is that mostly young mm -hmm. people that are just getting started in the marketing world? I've partnered with a group called Upgrad. It's a um, company out of India, like a Coursera. Um, so it basically they have relationships with universities throughout the world and um, they offer degree programs in partnership with those universities. So I teach a marketing MBA class uh, for Deakin University. It's a top business school in Australia. And then there's a Liverpool business school in UK. So I teach MBAs for marketing classes for those two. The majority of the students and them are somewhat younger, and the majority of the students are uh, uh, spread throughout the world, probably in areas that were more traditionally had less access to education. So, yeah, and there's, and it's not in the areas of where those universities are. So, I don't know if there's one student in Australia who's doing the program with Deakin, and I don't know if there's one per, per student in UK that's doing the program with with Liverpool Business School. Yeah, that's, I teach them on, I'm on Pacific time, probably the worst time since it, when you're doing a worldwide schedule, probably the worst like time zone to be in because we're at the very tail end of, of things. And, but I do it at 5.30 a.m. on some weekends there. And it ends up being for the majority of the world an okay time. And so I don't know how much interaction you have, but I, I guess a question I have related to that is, Someone who is, let's say, newer to marketing and going into it as a profession, 
what is something, I don't know, it could be one or two things or just a thought, mindset, whatever. What's something that they just aren't quite getting that they need to get early on in their marketing career? I know a lot of people that are listening in that probably are consider themselves either in marketing or they need to know more about it. What's something that people really miss when they're going into that field? I think, obviously, I think experience beats almost everything. But the thing is that a lot of times experience can be too specific to that job to where like you just continue to do the repetitive task of that job. And so I really think you need to be, and it, it doesn't have to be a formal education program. It doesn't have to be degrees or anything like that, but it, there's so much information online. And I listen to a lot of LinkedIn learning. Uh, so just continuing to, to play uh, different videos on different topics in the background through your day or audiobooks and listen to them on hyperspeed and stuff. You don't have to capture everything and fully understand everything. Just try to, through repetition, you're going to start to just remember it like you remember songs through repetition. But so I guess where I'm getting at is just because, and I found this too, is you could be doing a really good job in your job, but then if you go to another job, like the skills and the marketing, that everything is, you, you, it, it's different in some cases. So you need to continue to just look at things in a, I, I like in a big picture and you need it because I said experience beats almost everything you need to learn by doing. So just because you're doing stuff in your job, doesn't mean you can't be experimenting outside your job on little experiments of your own and however that may be, but that's some good info. So the follow-up to that, we've got a lot of listeners that are leaders or heads of their organization, business owners, some ministry leaders, things like that. And, and marketing is always a topic that comes up around leadership teams. Sometimes it's positive. Sometimes it's not just like most topics, but what are some things, and let me, I guess, let me ask it this way first. What are some things that most leaders of an organization miss when it comes to marketing or they're thinking wrong about it, or they uh, have a bad attitude or something? What are some things there? And then I've got a follow-up related to that about what you do when you step into an organization, maybe initially, but first let's go to that big picture. What are people missing or messing up on? related to, to marketing? I think a lot of people think of marketing as just the promotion of um, products or services. And you know, there's always been, uh, I don't know, the years, but a long time where there, there's been a concept or a model of that there's four P's in marketing. I mean, now some people have broken down to seven P's and different things, but I teach the four P's of marketing in those classes, which are pro being involved with the product, both making sure there's a product market fit, but also making we're understanding what the consumer's needs are and making sure the product adjusts to be the meet the consumer's needs. So product, price, understanding all the um, price elasticity of consumers, choosing the right price, choosing the right, just overall strategy with price. And then place, where are you going to be? For example, if you want to be a high-end product, a uh, luxury product, then you're not going to go to Walmart. But if you want to be selling high quantity, then maybe you go to Walmart or that goes the same way to Amazon. Like you got to think of where you're being sold, what that puts in the mind of consumers. And so your place, and then finally there's the promotion and that's all the ads and the uh, social media and all that, that, that kind of stuff. So I think a lot of people just look at marketing as promotion and, and, and they're too short minded with when marketing starts and ends, a lot of times, oh, the product's already made, the price already chosen, the place already chosen, just go promote it. And then also the don't do the sale of it because you're just in this little piece here. And really, I think marketing starts at the very beginning and marketing really truly never ends because even after the sale, you're trying to create loyalty, trying to create repurchases. And so to me, marketing goes over the entire business cycle or the entire purchase buyer's journey there from start to finish and even after. And so I think you just need to expand your concept of, or not anyone, but it's probably the biggest misconception is that not expanding the concept that marketing is a much wider thing and, and really integrated in all aspects of the business and including internal as well. So internal marketing and, and retaining employees and motivation of employees and everything else. So I had a thought that triggered that I, I had a client sometime back that 
I consider this a mistake. I'll let you be the judge of that. But they knew that they needed to generate more business. They had been primarily probably word of mouth referrals up to that point and had done very well. But they decided that they needed to up their leads and people coming in. And so their first engagement was with someone who specialized in social media and very specifically Facebook ads. That's I, I, they were very narrow and truthfully, it was not a good match. I actually started working with the leadership team shortly after that. I go, you know, I don't think that's where your audience is. I don't, that's not the, the place or where you need to be doing your promotion. And they've backed off. I think LinkedIn is a place, but I think people are very narrow and sometimes their thoughts about marketing and my observations, maybe it's where I come in and my seat at the table. But you obviously many times need to, as you step into the organization or have a first interaction or you're brought in as a fractional C-level or something like that, need to evaluate those type things. How do you do all that? What's the best first start? This is me getting into what do business owners need to be doing right now, especially if they're maybe very narrow and they've had I hate the term they got burned. We got burned. Somebody sold us Facebook ads, which I, again, that's a whole nother topic. But anyway, what are some thoughts? Does that make any sense? And and how do you respond when I bring that up? I think it makes a lot of sense. I, how you go in and examine a situation in the current infrastructure and the current processes and systems is going to relate to what I'm going to say, how you do what I think the ideal arrangement is is in my opinion, you need to have a very good marketing generalist, gen- a general manager of marketing, basically, of sorts. And you need to try to, I like to outsource a lot of things initially, keep it pretty skeleton of an outline there until a concept's proven and then start to bring it in-house. Whether you're working with the cost, whether you're generating leads in a certain way and then a call center is working on it, we'll start with outsourcing to a call center and letting them work it. And then if it starts to work, yeah, you are losing profit margin paying the outsourcing, but it's a lower risk. Then you start, as each uh, thing is proven, you start to bring it in-house more and more and start to outsource your graphic design, outsource your copyright. But as it start, as you start to see the value, then start to bring it in house where you've hit past the break even point that you're doing it in enough quantity that it's more efficient and more effective to bring it in house. But I think that all starts with having that general person in marketing that's in house, a very general, well rounded marketer because they're able to select and deploy the right, the right strategies at the right time or work with the right people. And if you have the right person, they probably have connections that are throughout the all your needs. And I guess that kind of goes into how I've been coming into companies. The thing is I, I come in and I figure out what they need right there. And I'm bringing in the connections, making the connections, whether they're in-house, out of the house, whatever. They can choose through a time to bring them in-house, keep them out of house. I, I think you need to be lean and you need to be quick to understand that the skill sets of one month may not be the same skill sets you need of the next month in your marketing. And you need to be able to adjust. When you got that specialist, like you were talking of maybe the social media person, but they were very specific. There's not a lot of adjustment that can be made month to month with that because they're just able to do what they do right there. And they don't, some of them don't even speak the language. If it's a little bit of a complex product or whatever that's being sold, you mentioned something that I want you to give us a little more info on. And I know that the easy answer would be, well, you need to get someone like Brandon because you're the marketing generalist. But I see a lot of leaders, a lot of people running organizations, and it could be companies that are attempting to scale. They're moving from a solopreneur to, or maybe a mom and pop to a little bit larger. They're starting to get a team around them. And they're wanting to continue growing and scaling. But I I believe that a lot of them don't know the questions to ask to know if they're really dealing with a generalist or not. It's like they're, they think that marketing is social media or they think that, and some of them are really, they will tell you, I just don't want to think about the marketing. It's so confusing. And 
I don't like social media and which lets you know some clues about them, but how can someone know if they're dealing with a generalist or a specialist? And I don't know if there's questions to ask. I don't know if you could think of some things because I would love for us to have a few questions here that leader of the organization could say, you know what, tell me more about this or, or what do you know about this so that I know I'm dealing with more of a generalist? I would, as a business leader, not say, oh, I need this, per- I need the social media thing, or I need that. I would talk to a marketer and ask them, or te- not ask them, tell them your goals. What are you trying to achieve? But what do you need to happen? And it may not be that you're describing like, I need this. And it's specifically not asking that I need this marketing thing to generate this. It's what do you need? What are the final results? What are you trying to achieve? What are the real goals? And then you're asking the marketer, How would you, what strategies, tactics, different elements would you uh, employ, deploy to, in in order to achieve this? How would you get help get us there? And what resources would you need to get there and see what their answer is? Because uh, I think that answer will tell you if they're a specialist or a generalist. And also, it goes, that's a tough thing because it goes back to then you, how, how do you know that's a for sure thing that what they're saying is going to work out and do you put your trust in them or do you, but I think that's the way I would approach it is really you're coming to a marketer because you need marketer, you need marketing help, not because you're saying how to, unless you have a deep experience in marketing, not to say, Hey, I need, I'm trying to deploy this tactic or this strategy to achieve this, just your goal and trying to understand how they may get you there because you may interview five different people and get five different views, but that will also, even if you don't hire any of those five, give you a better group of options of how to maybe what specialists you need to go out and hire to make it happen too. So, so this is going to be me countering the question I just asked. I'm going to ask you, is yeah. there a platform, a placement or something now that you really like, I mean, you're not going to force all your clients into it, but it's like, boy, you, you really like what's going on to get the word out about a product and all here. And we know it's not for everybody. This is not us saying this is where you go, but is there a placement that you're like going, this is a pretty good way to get a message or a product out to the world right now. So that that is counter the question I just asked. I want to totally say how ironic it is that I asked that after asking the other question. (laughs) At the grandest scale, I think, which is obvious, but just utilizing all that the internet has to offer because where I was going to go with this is that the answer is no, because it is audience specific, very audience specific. We launched a wheelchair brand and we're, we're looking at TV ads and traditional cable, but that's because of that audience of still older audience still on traditional cable versus You've got other people on streaming or you've got, if you're going for a younger generation, you go to TikTok or something like, it's not going to be the same. It's just not. But if you, in the grand scheme of things, I would utilize uh, all that the internet has to offer because of its tracking abilities, because of its ROI proving abilities, even though it may not be technically the most efficient uh, synergy by just doing internet, if you're just starting off with something you're trying to grow, that's the way you can make sure that your dollars are returning. Um, but no, the answer is no. I mean, if you're a local, if you're a local business, you want to really get deep into your local community offline too. And you want to be, and if you're a nationwide business, it's, it's too, and I'm sorry to say that it's just, it's too, it, it would be impossible to give one answer meets all business and that. Yeah. Good. I think you just helped me with the question that someone should ask if they're looking for a generalist because you gave a good generalist answer to that. So those that were listening to the question earlier, looking for the question, that might have been one. It's, Man, what's your favorite? And you really did a good job of not giving me one saying it's very specific to the situation. Hey, Brandon, almost my final question here. Looking out short-term future, longer-term, whatever, 
What are some things that are super exciting for you as far as the marketing world goes? And then what are some things that kind of bug you or are concerning you? And then there's just a few things we'll do to wrap up here, but just so big picture marketing, you really like the thought of blank and then something that's bothering you a little bit about the industry. I really like the the thought of making consumer experiences more enjoyable and the focus on the consumer's journey through and, and how to make eliminate friction, how to make uh, the experience more smooth and easy and fun and enjoyable and 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 which creates loyalty, creates referrals, creates reviews. There's a lot of things. So I really like the concept of experience. I was with a company that had a chief experience officer that like that was the focus. So I think I think experience is is very good. And actually even going back when I said I think Elon said everybody will be able to afford everything. The only thing that would be different at some point would be experiences or your yeah, your the brand, you could say behind it, but the experience or the emotions, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think experience is exciting. Something I don't like with marketing is probably the herd mentality of sorts. A lot of companies are feeling because another company does something that they have to do it to, or they're going to get left behind. And there may be some truth to that. And that may also be a it may be in a way, as long as the movements are good movements, good that everybody quickly follows. But I don't like, I, I was at a, at a conference of a lot of like top Fortune 500 companies, CMOs and different things, just listening into them and stuff. And it was just very interesting that there was a lot of, it was just a lot of whether they believe or feel this is the right thing to do or the right direction for their company they have to follow what others are following. And I just don't think that's the the herd mentality in anything in life is good. Yeah. There are a lot of people out there that are not doing a lot of original things. They're just copying other people and they're probably getting the results to (laughs) match up with that. Maybe they're successful at it, but anyway, great response there, Brandon. I appreciate it. Hey, listen, let's just say that someone wanted to connect with you, get some more info, maybe bring you in as that marketing person or just wanted to connect after they listen in on this. Sure. Where do you want to send people? Uh, you got any resources or anything that people might can get a hold of? And then I've got a final question I'll ask before we wrap up. You can find me on LinkedIn, Brandon Cobb, B-R-A-N-D-E-N-N-C-O-B. Uh, you can go to my website, marketingexec.us. And I would encourage you to reach out on either of those. Uh, there's an email on the website. There's a message me through LinkedIn, please connect. And then also just like being here on this podcast, I try to go on a variety of podcasts and I, I try to cover a, a wide range of topics that don't make any two the exact same. And so I would just say, go to YouTube, go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you, you listen to your podcasts and um, maybe just search my name and, and try to listen to some other podcasts. And then if it looks like maybe there's a fit or you want to follow up question on a specific topic, send me a message. I'd be happy to chat. Very good. Thanks for that, Brandon. Hey, we're seek, go create. I'm gonna let you choose one of those words that resonates more, means more and why, which word do you choose? I would say go because a book, we, we, you had given me the heads up, you're going to ask this question at the end. And I, I was thinking right away and I like all the words. I like all the words, but go is because a book that came right to mind when you, between those three words is there's a Steve Harvey book called Jump. And it's this called, it's basically the concepts like you just take a jump and you're going to catch your parachute on the way down or you're going to figure it out on the way. And I think that trying to have everything correct or right before you fully jump or go is going to prevent you from a lot of experiencing a lot of things that you would experience and figure out along. So I think just go. Very good. Yeah, I love that word go. I love all three words, obviously, but I love that word go. Thank you, Brandon. Man, I appreciate you joining us here. I think we've given some folks some great value just in the way they need to think about marketing and maybe some action steps, but I think definitely some concepts that they need to think about. Share this episode with folks. If you've listened in, I know business owners, leaders of organizations, please share this episode. That's a great way that people get exposed to new podcasts and get some great information. We have new episodes here every Monday. Until next time, continue being all that you were created to be.